I'm going to talk about different kinds of indigenous cultural tourism models that I'm very familiar with, um, either through places where I've personally worked or consulted or been invited to do some kind of research. The first thing I want to talk about is cultural centers. And I'm going to talk about the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage because I work there. And uh, I was the first. Uh, director of programming there when it opened up in 1999. It's kind of in part a place for visitors to come and learn about Alaska Native cultures, all Alaska Native cultures. It's in, it's in Anchorage, um, which is Athabascan territory, but so there's a lot of cultures that are kind of removed from where they're from and all smushed into, you know, like a five acre area in Alaska is a huge space, but, but it's a microcosm of cultures. So visitors come, they can see dance performances, they can see people demonstrating um, different kinds of things that they make, maybe traditional foods or clothing or um, carving, making art, things like that. And they can walk around this man-made lake and visit little replicas of the kinds of housing that different Alaska Native peoples would have lived in. And what I love about it is each, um, we call it a village site, each village site representing the major Alaska Native cultures uh, is manned by a couple of interpretive guides and usually they're younger people, maybe late teens, early 20s, but sometimes we have older people and what I love about it is that they're, they're urban, they're from Anchorage, so they get to talk about their culture and their heritage and they, and they learn about so much about how to communicate with people who are, who are um, different than them, communicate with all kinds of people from the lower 48, as we call the rest of the US. The tourism part is just a small part of what the Heritage Center does. It actually is by and for Alaska Natives. It was created by a mandate um, out of our AFN, which is the Alaska Federation of Natives, um, about 20 years ago. They decided that we needed to raise money to talk about ourselves and um, have a place for Alaska Native heritage that that we all control, that's not outside controlled. So to that end today they host an indigenous film festival, they have culture camps, they have after school programs for youth, they have classes on, on doing different kinds of art, so there's all kinds of community things going on that are by and for um, for Alaska Natives and other people who, are, who aren't Native but want to be there and want to share and want to learn about it. So I'd say the tourism part of it is some of it and, and that's an important mandate to share your culture with, um, with people who are curious about it. But what's more important is that cultural perpetuation that goes on. So there's another kind of place which I'm kind of loosely calling a cultural park. <laughs> so that's more like a theme park type place. It's more um, more geared 100% towards the visitor experience. Chagupai Aboriginal Cultural Park in Cairns, Australia, and this is an image of a dance performance that they, they do for the visitors on stage, but this place is pretty neat because it's got so many different ways that visitors can experience Aboriginal culture from this part of Australia. So you go in and um, there's kind of a open area and you go in and they have a, they call it like a multi-sensory theater. So it's this multi-million dollar high-tech theater um, where they tell stories about the dream time. And um, they have people on stage acting, but they also have um, like lasers and holograms that really, so when people who aren't Aboriginal, who didn't grow up with these stories, when they hear about supernatural things in the dream time, it's hard for them to picture it because they haven't grown up with it their whole life. So these holograms and kind of high-tech images help them to understand how um, the spiritual world, the material world, and the not material world is actually all together all the time and they can actually see it. If, we're, if the presenters and the people who work at these places represent many different clans or tribes or subfamilies might not own the stories, then they have to get permission and 
to tell them. And, and a good way to address this is to tell more generic stories that everybody kind of has a bit of ownership in. Origin stories kind of fit that bill. And that's a great thing to share with visitors, how we got here. If they know how you got here, they can really um, kind of begin to understand why it's important um, that indigenous First Nations um, have a different relationship to the land and a different relationship to the government and settler people and, and all of that. So they also have um, really fun stuff to do like boomerang demonstrations. They have a spear throwing kind of activity that you line up and it's, it's really fun actually. With an atlatl, yes, it's with an atlatl, which is very difficult to, to get right. And um, they have storytelling, and then they have these different areas, sections, kind of like the village sites at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, where you go to one and you'll listen to, like, say, a 20-minute presentation on, um, on bush foods. They have another one where men talk about um, hunting. And so, so it's a pretty nice experience, but it is, um, it is totally commercial, and it is 100% for the tourists. And, of course, they have... Um, like an elders committee and culture committees to make sure that the content that's delivered is accurate and correct. There's almost always a partnership between um, you know local community members and outside people who do have an expertise in this area. You need to really carefully negotiate those partnerships and the expertise that's brought in from outside um, to to direct it in the right in the right ways. So I wanted to share some feedback tourists have given about this place that I pulled from the TripAdvisor website. So we have, the Aboriginal hosts were the friendliest tour guides I've ever met. They made us feel a part of their culture in the friendliest way possible. They were smiling even when they thought we weren't watching. What great hosts! It's <laughs> awesome! <laughs> Took my family to Jagupai by night experience. Yes, oh, they have a night experience, which is kind of like the Australian Aboriginal version of a evening luau kind of, kind of thing. Uh, done extremely well and very entertaining. Spirit visit done inside the building was professionally managed and awe-inspiring. I never really understood why people overly bash an attraction for being too touristy. Jagupai Park is touristy, so it's kind of like the Disneyland of Aboriginal culture. It doesn't pretend not to be, but it still delivers a pretty fun day. No, it's not as authentic as if you tagged along a National Geographic expedition searching for lost Aborigines. So that really tells you something about what, you're, what, you're, what the customers were expecting when they went there. They really wanted that, that, that fantasy, <laughs> uh, anthropological fantasy, I would say. But it tries to introduce people to a culture using fun activities, shows, and exhibits. By no means is it a complete or exhaustive education of Aboriginal history, but it's not watered down either. So that's really important. When you are developing cultural tourism, sometimes you have to genericize things. Um, you can't boil down what takes an entire lifetime to learn to a one hour tour or experience. As you're starting to see by these quotes, you really can't please everybody. So you have to decide, who, who do you want to please? The people looking for authenticity, and I already heard during introductions that word authentic come up a couple of times. Just straight up cultural tours. So this is what uh, Sitka Tribe of Alaska's Tribal Tours does. This is kind of a standard, if you don't do tourism and you want to do tourism, one of the things that pops in people's minds is, let's walk you around, let's drive you around. It's easy to do. You might invest in a, a, couple of, a couple of vehicles or even a walking tour is even easier to get into um, and walk people around, uh, around your home. And another reason these are great is because they exist everywhere in the world. So when people visit places, they automatically think, where do I get the tour? And, and their idea of what a tour is in their head is riding on a bus or riding, riding in a van with a guide. So they already have an idea of what that is and they will look for it wherever they go. I wanted to share with you Tribal Tours' mission statement. To preserve traditional native culture in language, song, and dance. To provide the opportunity to educate current and future generations. To increase awareness of cultural expression and respect for cultural differences and to provide economic opportunities for tribal citizens. 
What's interesting about this mission statement, which I've seen in mission statements of indigenous tourism operators everywhere around the world, is that it's about cultural preservation first and making money last. So your mission statement really drives your tourism operation and, and really helps to create that sustainability and, and where it's going and the checks and balances that are needed to develop the operation. Coach, motor coach tours, bus tours, walking tours, things like that, um, they really work when they have a steady stream of visitors. In Sitka in Southeast Alaska, um, Sitka gets in the last 20 years anywhere from 150 to 250,000 people. They all come by cruise ship. They're just hand delivered. They don't even have to do any marketing at all. And I heard some of you talk about marketing, which is huge. Usually when you do a tourism workshop, you start with marketing and then get to culture. We're, we're doing the reverse. A, what's really important about tourism is to tell stories from your perspective. But B, it raises an intellectual property issue, um, something that we wrestled with a lot in, in cultural tourism at Tribal Tours and working for the Alaska Native Heritage Center is how far do you go into the stories? Um, how do you tell them? And how do you tell them in such a way where, where people understand the seriousness of it, but, you, but, but, but it brings you all closer together? Heritage tourism, the Not Not Conservation Park in Nildadi, Australia. And this is a park that's now being co-managed between the Manam Aboriginal Band and, and Southern Australia. This family has been running tours there of a 10,000 year old site of, of rock etchings that tells their histories and their stories and teachings about how to walk on the land, teachings about how to subsist, teachings about what's appropriate for boys to, girl, to do as they're growing up and teachings about what's appropriate for girls. Many teachings because prior to, to them developing these ways of interpreting uh, the site, the only way to learn about it was by reading archaeological descriptions of the site, which is going to be very different than the aboriginal understanding of their own place. Another type of tourism is tr what they call trekking in New Zealand, which is hiking, hiking tourism. Uh, you can add tons of value to a hike if you have a local who knows about the plants and how they were used and can, you can pick stuff along the way and tell stories about how the place came to be. People love hiking tours. This is the Kurusan Dance Festival. Event tourism is huge. There's a huge global market for event tourism. People travel to events. A lot of the tourism operations I've been talking about so far have been owned by um, tribal collectives or large family collectives, but I do want to mention that a lot of tourism is a single proprietorship. It's different from community to community, especially when you're talking about intellectual property and collectively owned cultural knowledge in some communities. It's not considered appropriate for individuals to sell that if it's not collectively decided upon. But in other areas, it's okay. And finally, this is the last one I'm gonna show you, field schools. But we ran a uh, pilot field school at a fish camp uh, on Admiralty Island uh, outside of Sitka, Alaska. And um, it was in partnership with Humboldt State University where I used to work. We brought students in from California to Alaska. It really blew my mind, stuff they didn't know, like salmon life cycle. I thought everybody knew that, but no, Californians don't. So we, did, we went to a fish camp, but the idea of this cultural immersion field school was to give these students an opportunity to experience immersion in another culture's way of being. But all the places that I've talked about so far, the types of models, follow what I call a cultural tourism formula, which I see everywhere, everywhere. Usually in this formula, you have a greeting, so that's pretty standard for hosting. Usually you have a guide who does kind of like cross-cultural interpretation. Usually you'll hear the heritage language spoken. It's really important to have conversations around language and, and even to integrate cultural tours and programs um, in partnerships with language revitalization programs. You almost always see um, traditional architecture and I say the word traditional with quotes around it because it's usually a, it's either scaled down, so it looks like um, 
like little people lived in them. It's never like the size it was in reality. Um, or it is retrofitted to, 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 accommodate, uh, to accommodate tourists. There's usually a performance, and the performance is usually the lifeblood of a, a cultural tourism program. Lots of demonstrations. I love demonstrations because it keeps artists, artists get to have a day job that, that isn't something that's not doing art, so that's great. And demonstrations are also an opportunity for apprenticeships. Um, having folks who know how to do things, folks who are experts and cultural bearers, sit down and, and teach younger people. It's a great venue for that. And there's always souvenirs and arts and crafts. People want to take something home that's tangible, that they can touch, so they can remember where they were. Think about what are the resources that you have in place. You don't have to think about the whole territory or even um, your tribal group. Maybe even just for you and your involvement in tourism and what you know. To kind of assess what's already here, what are the resources that are, that are in place, um, what are you dreaming about, what do you want what do you want tourism in this region to be like, ideally, five years from now, ten years from now? What, what would that look like? What would that involve? Just let your imagination run wild and um, what are some of the things that, um, that we need in this region to build capacity for tourism that directly addresses what fits your interests and involvement in the industry. So what, what do you think you would need to have in terms of um, guidance or advice or examples or worksheets or books, any way that, that you want to get information to make those dreams about five years from now really come true.